For the visionary vanguard of faculty, staff, and students of the University of Maryland School of Medicine, it was a pioneering year of clinical innovation, research discovery, and excellence in medical and graduate education. A new Renaissance curriculum was developed, and a culture transformation initiative was implemented. With new technology, breakthroughs in life-saving clinical care soared to historic new heights, while advances in basic science and genomics research laid the groundwork for future treatments and cures. And the School of Medicine's reputation as a global leader in infectious disease research was confirmed with an unprecedented record-breaking NIH contract awarded to Dr. Kathy Neusel, Director of the Center for Vaccine Development and Global Health. The $200 million contract, one of the largest in School of Medicine history, will be used to develop the first universal vaccine for influenza, one to cover all strains and eliminate the need to have a new vaccine every year. This is a different model on a larger scale than anything that has ever been done before in this field. Founded more than four decades ago by Dr. Myron Levine, the CVD will be the lead research center in the effort. We will intentionally give influenza virus to healthy volunteers so that we can understand exactly how people get infected with flu, how their body responds to infection, and importantly, we can use this model to test new influenza vaccines. I'm just so proud to be here and recognize the incredible work of uh, the University of Maryland School of Medicine and the fact that that is recognized nationally. Uh, we're very proud of you. Congratulations. On the battlefield and in other areas where access to blood is limited, a blood replacement product could save thousands of lives. That's why Dr. Alan Doctor is developing a freeze-dried blood substitute to keep patients alive until they reach the hospital. The artificial red blood cell is a bio-inspired, engineered artificial cell. So it has a biologic payload, which is a purified hemoglobin from red blood cells enveloped in a synthetic polymer shell to imitate the mechanical properties of a red blood cell. Even NASA has expressed interest in the blood substitute in preparation for a manned mission to Mars. Because of the weight, they can't bring blood. And because they would otherwise have to match everybody's blood type, or weaken one astronaut in order to transfuse another, buddy transfusions are not viable. Dr. Doctor is the latest of 21 scientists recruited under the Special Transdisciplinary Recruitment Award Program, or STRAP, accounting for more than $60 million in research funding. It was also a banner year for major grants, with significant awards from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the National Institutes of Health. Measuring the impact of HIV in African countries will be the focus of a major study by the Institute of Human Virology, funded by a $40 million CDC grant. To allow us to better identify where within the population the HIV epidemic is and to understand how to better respond for epidemic control. In 2019, total research funding to the School of Medicine increased once again with grants and contracts reaching a new annual high of $542 million, representing a 35% increase in research funding over the last five years. In partnership with the University of Maryland Medical Center, clinical revenue is up 21% over the last four years. And looking at AAMC funding data, the School of Medicine ranks eighth among all public medical schools nationwide. What is most exciting and just rewarding is the fact that based on the breadth and the depth of our research and the rate of growth that we've had over the past several years, we are recognizably one of the leading top tier research institutions in this country. We're ready to receive the organ. Life-saving clinical care also soared to historic new heights. We're launching. For the first time in history, an unmanned aircraft delivered a donor kidney to the University of Maryland Medical Center, where School of Medicine surgeons successfully transplanted the organ into a patient with kidney failure. Okay, yeah, we're good. We have technologies now that allow the unmanned transportation of really any payload. And what we've done is try to innovate those systems to allow our patients better access to higher quality transplantable organs. 
approaching Martin Luther King, 100 meters. All right, aircraft has successfully landed. I am disarming the vehicle. Oh, vehicle has disarmed itself. I'm approaching the vehicle to hardware disarm. All right, confirming Hamel's active. Temperature is appropriate. Organ doesn't appear to be injured at all. It looks like a perfectly transplantable organ. I feel a lot of people are going to get a lot more help a lot sooner because of this. I was just the first. It could have been anybody. I'm grateful. This is my son, Zachary O'Neill Harris. He died on December 12th, 2014 from a heroin overdose. Kristen Harris's son is among the half million people who have died of opioid abuse since 1999, a crisis the School of Medicine is tackling head on. One of the first things that we did here was develop what we call an overdose response program. And that basically was a take-home naloxone program. And then we would uh, prescribe it to them, or in some cases, we'd be able to dispense it to them. Emergency room patients are routinely screened for opioid use and offered treatment from counselors like Andre Ryan, himself a former addict. I know their fears. I know their shame. I know their guilt. I know how hard it is, you know, once you get clean to, to, to deal with the shame that you have. And I let them know, you know, that's real, but there's a way out of it. There's a way up and out. It doesn't matter where you live. It doesn't matter your socioeconomic status. It can happen to anyone. Hi, Dr. Pappas. Hi, nice to meet you. Using a telemedicine-equipped van, School of Medicine physicians are expanding access to treatment in underserved rural areas. What brought you in to see us um, on the treatment van today? I just kind of got caught up with some pills and stuff. Via video, patients in crisis can speak directly with a University of Maryland addiction specialist in Baltimore. We'll ask about some things about just um, your normal use pattern, how it's impacting your day to day, um, and talk about some, uh, some potential options for treatment, including buprenorphine. In psychiatry, in which we have we are, have underserved areas where we just don't have a lot of mental health professionals, it allows us to reach a group of patients that would not be able to get treatment with, with, unless they had telemedicine. She seized on the way down here, guys. She kind of lost consciousness. It's a dire emergency. A 42-year-old diabetic woman is nine months pregnant and in full cardiac arrest. She has no pulse now. It seems real, but it's actually a simulation designed to train trauma physicians on how to deal with the most complex cases. The way this is going to work is you're going to do a vertical skin incision. The one-of-a-kind medical mannequin allows doctors to simulate an emergency C-section. Baby's out! The model was amazing, actually, at uh, C-sections and really felt real when it came down to it. When you deliver a baby via C-section, you there's some mechanics that you need, and the mechanics are not necessarily easy to figure out. The course is unique in its realism, preparing doctors and nurses for situations they may rarely encounter. Worldwide, the problem of maternal morbidity and mortality is even more profound. There's estimates that up to 830 women per day lose their life unnecessarily to pre potentially preventable problems during their pregnancy. How are you? Everything, the scan looks perfect. Physician scientists are also taking on the most complex cases at the University of Maryland Greenabom Comprehensive Cancer Center. Gary Maxwell is alive today thanks to Dr. Joseph Friedberg and the new surgical techniques and therapies he pioneered to treat mesothelioma. And today when I saw Dr. Friedberg, uh, a few days shy of my, my four year anniversary, I was told that the scans were negative, everything is, is fine. Gary was so thankful he made a gift to the School of Medicine to support Dr. Friedberg's research. Even a modest donation can make an enormous difference. Grateful patient Yvonne Wright established the Endocrinology Patch Fund to cover out-of-pocket expenses for diabetes patients like Eunice Lewis, who often had to choose between paying for her medicine or paying for food. What a blessing to give. You have no idea what it feels like to help somebody else when you can and you don't, you think it doesn't make a difference, but it really does. Donations to the School of Medicine approached $53 million in 2019, the second highest total in the past five years. 
Thanks to a generous donation, the school established two new endowed professorships this year. Dr. James Caper was invested as the James and Carolyn Frankel Distinguished Dean's Professor, and Dr. Margaret McCarthy was invested as the James and Carolyn Frankel Endowed Dean's Professor. In Dr. McCarthy's lab, postdoctoral fellows and graduate students are helping to shed light on how the brain develops differently in males and females. We call it rough and tumble play. And the boys do this more frequently and more intensely than the females. The research team discovered that newborn brain cells in the amygdala are gobbled up by immune cells known as microglia. So what we found is that there isn't a sex difference in the microglia eating during development in these other brain regions. By engulfing these newborn cells, we can shape the developmental architecture, uh, which will later, later produce um, sex differences in the circuitry and subsequent play behavior. The research could one day lead to new treatments for diseases that affect more boys than girls. Boys have much higher rates of autism, early onset schizophrenia, uh, neurological disorders associated with speech pathology such as stuttering, Tourette, Zipraxia, etc. much, much more frequently than girls do. A renovated lobby with a new display of historic women in medicine reflects a new era of culture transformation. Safety, respect, inclusion just are, are, are key to any workplace. Launched after a town hall style listening tour, the Culture Transformation Initiative will hold people accountable for disruptive behavior and promote equity in compensation and promotion. Disruptive behaviors on the part of faculty tend to thrive in male-dominated hierarchical organizations and simply the appointing of women in leadership roles has a, an effect of eliminating some of those behaviors. Accordingly, the school's senior leadership has been restructured to ensure that women are represented at the highest levels, with more women serving as department chairs. Incoming surgery chair Dr. Christine Law is promising inclusivity in the department. I've had a lot of people who have helped me develop my career and I want to actually be able to do that for the next generation of surgeons. Dr. Victoria Marchese, the newly appointed chair of physical therapy and rehabilitation science, says culture transformation will foster collaboration to expand clinical research. We already blend all the cultural transformation components into what we do with our faculty, what we do with our students, and we will just continue to embrace that and move forward. More women have been promoted to executive leadership positions, and women now comprise 45% of the Dean's Cabinet. There is nothing more boring than a room full of all of women or a room full of all of men. That what you get the best out of is a room full of different people from different backgrounds with different ideas. We all have biases. Let's recognize we have them and accept them. Mandatory unconscious bias training is in place for senior leaders and will soon be available to all faculty and staff. To understand how our biases may sometimes have an intended impact, uh, impact that is not what we would want and support our core missions. I love what I do and I'm good at it. Women in Medicine and Science has been established to support the professional and academic success of women faculty. You have to recognize a problem before you can fix it, and I think finally it's on the forefront of people's minds, and we know that we have to make changes to keep up with the times. This Culture Transformation Initiative is important to me. You can't spend time listening to faculty, staff, students, and not become personally impacted by what people have said. A major transformation of the medical school curriculum was developed and approved with a more streamlined approach to learning about the human body and more active learning to promote critical thinking. We are moving towards more small group, team-based learning, group learning sessions where the students can learn on their own at home and then demonstrate to us that they've mastered the material. Students will start their rotation sooner and letter grades will be eliminated. What's important to students is that their work is recognized for something other than an A, B, or a C. Um, and so we suggested switching to a tiered um, pass-fail system. Student wellness is a priority. Students will get more downtime after major tests with activities like the student boat trip. Patient care begins with self-care and unless they learn how to take care of themselves and be healthy, it's going to be really difficult for them to take care of other people. We'll be doing three different recipes. That's one reason why the School of Medicine is one of the first in the country to make a class on nutrition and healthy cooking part of the core curriculum. Yeah. 
It's called culinary medicine. This is all about practical nutrition, education, behaviors, both for the patients and for the students themselves. I think being a doctor involves a lot of not just clinical knowledge, but also life knowledge that you might need to pass on to your patients. Becoming a Renaissance physician also requires cultural competence. Medical Spanish is helping students overcome language and cultural barriers. Being able to be there and actually speak the language directly with the patient will be very helpful for both parties. Dr. Sandra Casada says it's important for physicians to understand and respect cultural differences. In the Latino culture in general, um, physicians are actually put on much more of a pedestal, you would say, than maybe in American culture, and so there's more of a distance that that can create. Importantly, the School of Medicine was reaccredited this year by the Liaison Committee on Medical Education. In the community, the School of Medicine is increasingly active with programs like Reading on the Brain. We got taste, we got smell. Teaching city school children about brain science and the importance of reading. These kids are absolutely learning how the brain works. In fact, we started from day one with concepts, general concepts of the, about the brain, and we delve really deep across this year with these kids understanding how the concept of the basic neuron. The students painted a giant mural and even had some help from the mayor and a local artist. Reading on the Brain is enjoying strong support from teachers and parents, not to mention the students. From community service to research, education, patient care, and culture transformation, it was truly one of the best years ever for the University of Maryland School of Medicine.